We'll start with the script tree now. This is the script that covers the three main techniques that you must use in your classification workflow to improve your results. You can see we have done a basic classification workflow. We had our GCPs, we split them into 60, 40 partition, train the model with training GCPs, use the validation GCPs to test the accuracy. And our visual results are good, our accuracy is quite good. And now we want to improve this classification. Sometimes your model cannot distinguish between different classes or there's a confusion between two classes. Uh, I'll teach you some of the techniques that will help you improve the accuracy of both the visual results as well as your number. Remember that for kind of real world uh, classifications, anything above 80% is quite good. Just to set your expectation, if you're working on a country level classification and you get 80% accuracy, you should be really happy. The best in class classification currently uh, at a global scale is the ESA world cover, about 75% accuracy. So again, just to set your expectation, do not aim for 100% accuracy. On the contrary, if you see 100% accuracy, look at your code twice, there might be a mistake in doing this, right? So typically in, in Earth observation, you do not get a very high accuracy. So this is already a pretty good accuracy, So, but we'll see how to improve this number. Also, do not obsess on the number when you're working on a classification, because what this is telling you is that we had 150 or so points, and this is the accuracy at those 150 points. It's not the accuracy of your overall classification. Because that's, all, that's the only places you can check you had a ground truth. So this is one metric, but also look at the visual results. So when I'm working on improving the classification, I would pick a region that I'm familiar with and then do all the stuff to say iteratively, can I improve this region? Because I've seen that the roads and buildings are not coming out very clear. When I do stuff, uh, does it improve that region? Both visually and also I'll keep an eye on the number. So again, with that, let's see what are the different things that you must do to make your classification better. So, a few things that you must do. One is cloud masking. So far, what we have learned is when we are creating our composites, we remove very cloudy images and keep images which have less clouds. But that means we still have clouds in our original images. And then when you create the composites, they still have cloud contamination. So when you're creating a median value, you are taking the median value from cloudy pixels. So one option for us is that we can actually remove those pixels, set those pixels as no data. And to do this, we can leverage the data sets that come with our, uh, the original data set itself. So we can leverage the Sentinel-2 bands that come with us. So we are using the Sentinel-2 level two data this data set comes with multiple bands with cloud information. So you have our reflectance bands from B1 through B12, and we have this bands, mask probability and snow probability. These bands are generated during the pre-processing of the data by the provider. So when they process the data from raw values to TOA reflectance to level two surface reflectance, they generate some data which helps you determine what is the probability that each pixel is either cloud or snow. And you can use this to say, I will use this and figure out, remove all the pixels which are cloudy. Not just the whole images, but the pixels. And then we can uh, create a composite. How do you mask the clouds? Your code editor comes with uh, cloud masking functions for different most commonly used data sets. If you go to your code editor, you have the examples folder. In the examples folder, you have a folder on cloud masking. This has got cloud masking functions for Landsat, 4578, Modus, and Sentinel-2. So we can take this image and we say we take our Sentinel-2, take this cloud masking function, and apply it. You don't need to understand how it works. You can just pick the function from here and apply it. There are different functions available. The, the best cloud masking function that's available currently was just recently launched during the previous Geo for Good. It's called Cloud Score Plus. This is based on a machine learning model that Google built, uh, and it's really incredible. Uh, the results are really fantastic, better cloud mask than anything else. But currently, it's only available for images from 2023, and they are generating it for the older time series as well. 
But if you're struggling with Cloud Mask in your region, try this Cloud Store Plus. This is a really fantastic uh, mask that you can use, and the script will allow you to do this. For now, we're just going to stick with the, the bands that come with us. We're going to use the Snow and Cloud probability bands to apply a Cloud Masking function. So we start with our data, and we find the Cloud Masking function for our data set. I'm going to just keep paste the function here. This function takes an image, returns the masked image. It's going to remove all pixels where the cloud pro probability is less than 10%. We are not using the snow probability here because the region just doesn't have snow. But if your region has snow, you can use this band as well and select the pixels that are snow. And what you get is an image without any clouds, theoretically. Again, all the cloud masks have problems. They're not you know, perfect, so you'll still get some clouds, but it will be better than not doing anything at all. So we have this function. We have to apply it on all images. So we have our filtered collection of images. So in our region for the time period, we have found 57 images. And before we create the composite, we need to mask clouds in all of them. So from now on, once you learn about cloud mask, your workflow would be start with the data set, apply your filters. Once you are done with the filter, immediately map a cloud masking function. Done. Now we have removed clouds from those 57 images. And then you select the bands you want and then create a median composite. This results in a much better composites. And again, this is a pre-processing step that you must do for all your data sets. Here we are still filtering for very cloudy images because cloud masks are not perfect. If you select images which are 90% clouds, you might still get cloud contamination. So it still helps to filter for very cloud images, but again, mapping a cloud masking function is uh, helpful. I'm going to copy and out this part so we can see how it sounds. So we are done with this first part, cloud masking. This should definitely give you a boost in your accuracy if you have a much cleaner composite. Let me print this composite. So we have a 12 band composite image and we have our training data where we take our GCPs and sample this particular image and we'll get your training data where you have the 12 properties sampled from your original bands and you have the land cover values. Now, this values, the reflectances are useful, but they, there are better inputs available for classification. We know that remote sensing indices are very closely correlated with the land cover. So if you want to detect vegetation, NDVI will be helpful. If you just tell NDVI that is much more closely correlated than band five or band four itself. So the band ratios are much more closely correlated. So what you can do is you can help the machine learning classifier learn better by giving it the value of the index at each point. How do we get the value of index at each point? Well, you can just compute them on your image. So I'm going to take my composite, I write a function, and say, I have this function given an image, it'll compute NDVI, NDBI, MNDWI, and BSI. I'd like to use one index per class. So NDVI for vegetation, NDBI for built up areas, urban areas, MNDWI for water, BSI, bare soil index for bare. And this helps the classifier learn how to separate those much better. So see what happens. I can say, my composite, we're going to call this function add indices. That means it's going to now add four more bands to my composite based on this indices. So my composite has suddenly become so my composite was a 12 band composite. It now has 16 bands. You can see I've added this bands here. And now what happens when I sample from the 16 band composite? My training data has the value of index at that point. 
So now when I train a machine learning model, it has got 16 columns to learn from. It says, given these values, predict that this is zero. You don't need to say which is important or which is not. The classifier will pick and find that, okay, I know that this one is, uh, NDBI is always high when there is zero, use that to learn and find the pattern. So now you can just throw data at the classifier and your model will keep improving. And adding new data is as simple as adding new bands to your composite. And you might be thinking, okay, what if I want to add some other bands? Maybe I want to the classifier to learn from the elevation data. Maybe there's a correlation between elevation and the class. Can I learn from the elevation data? Well, you can do that. Let's bring in some elevation data. Here, we're going to bring in some elevation data from the catalog. There are many uh, DEMs available. You can use whichever you want. Here, we are using the ALOS data. And we can get the elevation and slope from that image. Earth engine has a function e terrain slope where you can give an elevation and get the slope. And I want to learn from elevation and slope as well. So I can just say, my composite is now composite with these two additional bands. So you can see my composite has become composite with 18 bands. And now my features, which I extracted, also has those 18 values. So now my machine learning classifier's job is to say, given this reflectances, given this indices, given this elevation, predict the zero. Maybe there's a correlation. You don't know. Maybe you know if there's a high slope, there is less likely to be an urban area. Maybe there's a correlation. And the classifier will pick it up and try to differentiate between those two classes. When I worked on a project with coffee classification, elevation was one of the most important parameters, right? Coffee grows at higher elevation. So if you see two vegetation pixels, one is at higher elevation, higher likelihood of that being coffee versus other vegetation. There's a question around if the pixel is under shadow, the probability of cloud is how much? Can it detect shadow to the clouds? Yes. So there are uh, the Sentinel 2 level 2 data has one more band called SCL, SYN classification. And this has information about cloud shadow. So you can see there's a cloud shadow. So it can detect cloud and cloud shadows both. And you can use this to mask out cloud shadows. So typically you mask snow, cloud, and cloud shadows for your data. If you compare different versions of cloud masking, right? If you see the level one cloud mask that you get the Sentinel-2, that's okay. The level two cloud mask is much better, uh, but again, it still makes a mistake. And you see the new cloud score data from Google, and that is almost perfect. At least everywhere I look, it's almost perfect. So I would definitely encourage you to use the Cloud Store Plus whenever you can, especially when you're using Earth Engine. Uh, but it's only available for a subset of data currently. But you know that is very accurate about clouds, cloud shadows, and it works in a kind of haze environment. It can remove that as well. All right, so you can see we can add all the different uh, additional features that might be important to our model. If you think temperature might be useful, well, get a temperature data set and add it as a band, and your model will learn from that. One of the things that if you've done this using remote sensing, you'll suddenly see that why is this so easy here in Earth Engine? Because if you want to do this in uh, your traditional way, you say, I have the Sentinel data, I want to add a band of elevation data. The first step you need to do is you need to reproject and resample your data to that projection. And then only you can add that as a band. Earth Engine is a flexible system. Each band of an image can be in a different projection. You can see this one is in 426. This one is in, you know, might be in different projection. Doesn't matter. You can have different bands in different projection, different pixel sizes. When you sample your values here, you say scale 10. It's going to resample everything at 10 meters. You can also specify CRS. It'll be resampled and reprojected to that particular projection and pixel size. It is done behind the scenes automatically. That means you are now able to combine different data from different sources. And since the catalog has all the data, you just specify what you want, combine them, and you never worry about projections and uh, resampling. It all happens under the hood. So we have a pretty good training data and we can learn from that. The last thing that we want to do is scale the inputs. If you pass on this kind of training data to your classifier, and you say, learn from this, the way classifiers work 
is they get biased towards large values. When they see the values like this, they say, oh, this band 11 is 3000, but your NDVI is 0 0.03. This must be more important. So we'll say, I'll learn from the, I'll give preference to features that have higher values. But that's not the case, right? We just say, you have to figure out what is important. You don't get biased towards large values. The large values are just a result of how the data was processed. So one of the things that you do is always you scale your inputs so that all the values have the same magnitude. Here, we wanted to learn from elevation. What is more important is the relative differences. So if a pixel is 500 meters and 1,000 meters, there's a difference of two between them. One is twice the magnitude. It doesn't matter what the absolute magnitude is. So if you have an elevation of 500, you can say this one will be 0.5 and 1,000 will be one. So the magnitude is reduced to between zero and one, but relatively they are having the same difference. So we'll apply some scaling. There are multiple ways to do it. The one easy way is to do normalization where you take each band, find the min max value of each band and scale all the bands between zero to one relative to the min max of that. I have a function that I've written for normalization which will, you can just copy paste. It's in your script, it's also available in your supplement. So you can just take this and add it here. So this is a function, takes an image, returns a normalized image. So let's normalize a composite. Done. So our normal composite is now normalized. And you'll see the result when we extract the data from it. You see all the values they are between zero and one. The two features had the same relative magnitude, but the absolute magnitude has now been scaled to between zero and one. And now the classifier will treat all of these parameters with equal importance and figure out the real pattern between those. Now, at least by doing these three things, you should see significant improvements in your results. Let's see what we get. So now we uncomment the remaining part. So do at least three things, apply a cloud mask, add additional bands of indices and scale the reports. And you can see we caught like, you know, it was 93% and we caught a 94.8% accuracy. But visually also, if you compare the result, it shows a significant improvement. So you can apply the same thing to your particular region. So you already have a script that you have you know, put together, apply this technique you should see improvement in your detection of different classes. There are many more advanced techniques, but at the bare minimum, uh, all scripts should have this. So if you're just doing supervised classification for any real work, make sure you have a cloud mask, make sure you have indices, and make sure you scale your inputs. And that's the bare minimum that you must do to have a complete classification workflow. At the end, if you're trying to print accuracy or you're trying to do uh, see the result, it may result in a computation timed out or computation too large or some errors like this. The solution to this is to export, which we'll cover in the next script.